Welcome to The Way They See Us, Images of Spain from Abroad, a compilation of depictions and visions of Spain by artists and scholars who've devoted their professional and sometimes personal lives to Spain. As you know, Isidro Cervantes' mission is the promotion of the Spanish language and the cultures of Spanish-speaking countries. And this is what this program is all about, talking about Spain's many different cultural expressions and art forms, but seen from outside. In this, our third chapter, we've we have American scholar and writer Edward Stanton, who's written 12 books so far, and who's lived, worked, and researched about Spain for decades. Most of his published works are related to Spain, Hemingway and Spain, A Pursuit, a Spanish translation, Hemingway and España, Roads of Stars, Spanish translation, Camino de las Estrellas, and uh, of course, his latest creation, Vidas, Deep in Mexico and Spain. Having made a name for himself in the world of Spanish language, culture and society, we're extremely curious to see what he has to say and to tell us about Spain from a diachronic standpoint. So Edward, thanks for being here with us today. I'd like to ask you a few questions if that's okay with you. I'd be delighted. <laughs> How challenging is it to put in writing your views and perceptions about a country that is not your own? Because normally when analyses, views or opinions come from an out insider, they are easily taken for granted, but they are much more easily challenged if they come from a stranger, let's say. Let's face it, locals can sometimes get away with anything, even if what they are saying is questionable. <laughs> that is very true, but the outsider does have an advantage, and that is the advantage of seeing things with new eyes and not taking things for granted, and having that sense of wonder and even awe when you visit a new country. And also, I always remember the words of Nietzsche, who said, you have to leave your own country and go visit other countries to understand your own country. So for me, knowing, learning about Mexico and Spain were really ways of kind of understanding my own country better, the United States. And after all, our three countries are really tied. We are linked, the three of us, right? The three countries in, in our history, in our language, in our culture, uh, for good and bad. So that I think is, is the advantage that a foreigner has going to a foreign country. And that's the reason, Richard, why good newspapers like the New York Times and others, as far as foreign correspondents go, they only let foreign correspondents go to a given country or to a given city like Madrid for a year or two. And then they pull them out because they want them to have that kind of objectivity and not go native, not identify too much with the people there. So definitely the first arrival and the first impressions are always very important. Okay, so in your latest book, Bidas, Deep in Mexico and Spain, which is by the way, fascinating and highly recommended for those of you listening, make sure you get a good read of that because it's amazing. What led you to make Spain and Mexico uh, the focus of your attention? Well, I grew up in Los Angeles, a city that was founded by Spaniards in the 18th century with one of the most beautiful names of any city in the world. The Spaniards called it Puebla de Nuestra Señora, La Reina de Los Angeles. What a beautiful name. And um, I grew up in Los Angeles, two hours from the Mexican border, which I call the most radical border in the world because it's the only border in the world where you have such a, a, a radical clash of cultures, of language, of history. And uh, very young as an adolescent, I became interested in the bullfight. And I even thought that I wanted to be a bullfighter at one point until I realized that Mexicans and, and Spaniards would not accept uh, a foreigner probably as a bullfighter anyway. <laughs> and for other reasons, but that helped me learn the language. I read all the books I could possibly read in English about the bullfight. And then I started reading books in Spanish without knowing the language very well. But when you have that kind of motivation, you, you learn things without even much effort. I learned much more that way than I did in school. So growing up in Los Angeles, which by the way, has more Mexicans in it than any city in the world except Mexico City, more than Guadalajara, more than Monterrey, et cetera. It was natural for me to be fascinated by both Mexico and eventually by Spain. So was, was Spanish uh, as visible and, and audible basically in, in Los Angeles of the, in those days? I mean, as, as it is today? No, we're talking about the 1950s, and really the, the Latino or the Chicano culture were almost hidden at that point. I did go to school with a few 
uh, Mexican American uh, children, boys and girls. And I was fascinated by their differences, their home lives. And uh, that was probably the way things started. Then there was the interest in the language and uh, in the Spanish language, you know, which seems so expressive to me. And I was fascinated from an early stage with Proverbs and notice how Spanish speakers all over the world tend to use Proverbs more than we do in English or in the other languages I know, which are French and, and Italian. So I'm always fascinated by, uh, by Proverbs and um, especially Proverbs that don't have an equivalent in other languages. Like there's no other way in another language to say, como Pedro por su casa, right? right? Uh, the, the Proverbs like that. Or in my first trips to Spain in the 1960s, still during the Franco area, I was staying in terrible, very cheap hotels and pensiones, pensiones de mala muerte. <laughs> and um, I learned very quickly the proverb, a mala cama, colchón de vino. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is true that when I was reading your, 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 your books, I mean, you, you always resort to these proverbs and you explain them in detail. So it's, it's interesting because some of them I hadn't even thought about myself. I just used them and I just never had time to sort of think about the, the exact content or meaning of them, but uh, that was interesting. Now, since you mentioned Spain, you've devoted, mo devoted most of your adult life to Spain and Mexico, but, uh, but I, I suppose the first question should be why Spain? Because I mean, Mexico and Los Angeles, okay, I can see the why, but I, mm -hmm. I can't see the why for a, but for a far away country like Spain. In right. those days. Yeah, it couldn't have been any farther away as long as I was in the United States. But after all, the name Los Angeles was given by the Spaniards. The name of the state, California, is a word that was uh, invented by a Spaniard in the 16th century named Montalvo in a uh, novel of chivalry, una novela de caballerías, right? Uh -huh. California meant calido, caliente, forno, horno, right? Yeah. And it was kind of a paradise. Uh, and uh, so there, there was that background. But then the interest in the bullfight and the language had to lead me eventually to what used to be called La Madre Patria, to, mm -hmm. to Spain. So I made my first trip in 1964. It was November. Uh, I had this image projected of Spain as really being sunny and, and warm. <laughs> and you know, basically the image of Spain that, that was projected and is still projected abroad is the image of Andalusia, Andalusia. Not, not El País Vasco and not Asturias or Galicia. Yeah. So I, I did not have enough clothes. You know, I was cold I had to, because I had this, this stereotypical image of, of Spain. And uh, I look back on that and I see how, how naive I was. Right, yeah. You do talk about Galicia. That's, that I seem to remember about that in the book. And I was just thinking about that, that you weren't properly clad for the occasion. <laughs> <laughs> so that's Spain also, isn't it? Eh? <laughs> yes, okay. yes. So from the perspective of an American reader, writer, traveler, researcher with a wealth of experience in Spain, how can you compare the way Americans and Spaniards view and value the following concepts? Let's see. Time. Time is precious in Spain, and uh, especially the time that is devoted to doing nothing, namely at Osio, <laughs> right? <laughs> and my first impression in Spain was, why are all these people in a rush? And I would often see people rushing somewhere, and then I'd see the same person later sitting on a park bench, smoking a cigarette, enjoying the sunshine, or sitting in a, in a bar drink, uh, drinking a, a cafe, a coffee. So um, yeah, I think uh, in the the famous the the old saying or the old um, toast or bring these um, salud, amor, pesetas y tiempo para gastarlas. El tiempo is the most important part there, right? And, you know, I remember, Richard, in my first trips to Spain, there were so many blind people in the streets, especially those nice. uh, selling lottery tickets. Mm -hmm. And I can still, in my ears, I can still hear the ringing of para hoy, para hoy, para hoy, right? And yeah. that always seemed to me kind of a carpe diem, right? <laughs> Seize the moment right now, today. And then this sense among Spaniards that you, you have to enjoy time, squeeze it dry, and especially time when you're not working. You know, which leads to the other topic that you, you mentioned, I believe, and that is the, the work ethic. 
right? You need to update that. That's the last saying you use with it, without us instead of pesetas, don't you? Now we're going to have to sort, sort of review some of the sayings and, and update them, put, the, put them in perspective to the 21st century now. <laughs> I think people will continue saying pesetas. And I remember talking to one of my friends and I asked him, do you miss the peseta? And he said, si, hecho de menos la pesetilla. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Okay, second concept, work ethics. You know, some of the hardest working people that I've ever seen in my life have been in, in Mexico and Spain. Uh, on the other hand, I think there is a different kind of mentality about work among many uh, Spaniards. And, and let's talk about Spain. Uh, I remember a friend of mine who got a new job. This is probably 10, 15 years ago. Right. And I asked the normal question, how do you like the new job? And he looked at me as if I were from another planet <laughs> and said, <laughs> why should I like it? I, I, of course, I don't like it. I only do it because I have to, right? No nos gusta el trabajo a, a, a ninguno de nosotros. And I just thought that was so strange because many Americans probably feel the same way, but they probably would not say it, right? Uh, I think this may have changed in, in, in the current time with globalization and with you know, our consumer society and uh, international companies or multinationals and whatnot. Right. But um, that was certainly my impression um, uh, when, when I first got to Spain and even much later. Hmm. Okay, and the third concept I'd like you to uh, to to compare, uh, or well, to see what how how they compare them in America and in Spain, for example, friendship. You know, I live in the heartland of the United States in the state of Kentucky, and yet most of my very best friends are still in the Spanish-speaking world, in Mexico, in Argentina, in Latin America, and in Spain. I really think that the uh, sense of friendship. Uh, is very different and more profound in Spain. And in the United States, a uh, friendship between, let's say, two men or two women is often seen with a little bit of suspicion, perhaps, as being maybe unnatural, but not so much in, in, in Spain. And, uh, you know, friendship in, in Spain and social life in general involves a lot of touching, you know, physical warmth and, you know, abrazos and, and this kind of thing. And I really have become a kind of abrazador or that kind of person. Now, my, my American friends call me a hugger, right? Because <laughs> I've spent so much time in Spain. But yeah, I think there is a, a way to be, become a deeper friend and develop a friendship uh, at a more profound level in the Spanish-speaking world. And that's certainly been my, my, uh, <clears throat> my experience. And that's exactly the same, would you say, in Spain and in Mexico? Or do you see a difference between them? I do see a difference between them. Yeah, I do see a difference between them, maybe because I've spent a lot more time in, in, um, in Spain than I have in Mexico, and I have longer, more enduring friendships. Um, but I don't think I would be able to, I'm not an expert on, <laughs> on, on, the, on the subject, but I will say I've had very deep friendships with men and women in, in both countries and other countries of, of Latin America. Okay, so let's concentrate on Spain again. Let's see what trait of the Spanish way of being would you recommend them to change and or tweak? And uh, what would you tell them they should be most proud of? Okay, they should be most proud of their generosity because that's one of the things that, has, uh, that shocked me from the very beginning when I started going to Spain in the mid 1960s. The country was much poorer than it is now. Uh, there were a lot of wounded people from the Civil War on the streets, people who lacked an arm, a leg, both legs, blind people. There was a general sense of relative poverty. And yet, whenever I would go out with the Spaniard, they would always pick up the bill, they would always pay. And I love the Spanish custom of one person paying for the bill in a bar, in a tasca, in a cafe, instead of that ugly Anglo-Saxon or Northern European scene of friends fighting among themselves to see who's gonna pay or dividing the bill up into 10 parts for the poor waiter to have to put those together. And I always thought, this is not fair because someone is gonna get, um, get, get the raw end of the deal and have to pay more than someone else, right? But if you live in Spain and you go to a bar regularly, as, as many do, and the, the, the drink you have is never la ultima, it's always la penultima, things will even out in the end, right? So I've always uh, loved, loved that, that, uh, that custom. Um, 
in the first interview in this series of how they see us, uh, you talked to uh, William Chislet, who's become a new friend of mine. And he mentioned the obvious fact that Spain is a loud country. And I'm not going to tell Spaniards to quiet down and don't talk so loudly because I myself, when I'm in Spain, talk louder. And when I talk to my Spanish friends on the telephone, my wife tells me, why are you talking so loud? And it's like, when, I in, when in Rome, when in Rome. <laughs> That's right. And of course, it's unconscious, right? Mm -hmm. But I will say this, that uh, because the, the noise level in Spain is often high in a bar, in a restaurant, or wherever, um, those Spaniards who know how to listen and to speak softly stand out. And uh, it's really, it's kind of the contrast between the, the loudness of the general volume uh, in the atmosphere and speaking um, softly. So that's, that's something that I don't find in this country where people tend to speak at kind of a more medium uh, volume in general. Okay, so this is for the pe people out there listening or watching us right now. If you want to see all these concepts and the, these definitions and views in action, don't miss Vidas Deep in Mexico and Spain, uh, Edward Stanford's latest uh, creation, work of art, and uh, an amazing read. Thank you very much, Edward. It was a pleasure. It's been a pleasure having you here with, with us today and uh, for taking your time to be with us. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Richard.